How is it going? It's going pretty well. Um, just worked all day in bed, so I have like truly not left my bed in like almost 20 hours. That's relatable. I've had the last yeah. um, couple days off, so definitely uh, been in the same clothes, have not showered, living that kind of lifestyle. Yeah, how, uh, how have you been? So you said you've been in bed all, all day working. Yeah. Yeah, in bed all day working. Um, it was my last day. I, have, I had a one-day work week this week because I have the rest of the week off to recover from my top surgery revision tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So that'll be nice. Yeah, what have you been um, working on? Uh, so it's a, it's a new year, 2022. Do you have any kind of plans uh, artistically? So I feel like I want to do another episode of the variety hour this year but i just don't i don't really know i don't have any like good clear ideas coming to mind um and i i almost feel like i want to take like a a step back and do something that's more like easy to do on an everyday basis you know instead Mm -hmm. of something that like takes like you know over the course of like a couple months um and like i don't work on it every day i think it would be fun to work on a project every day or like a couple times a week um something that like doesn't take quite as long also would be nice and also something that doesn't require as much editing um we all know i hate video editing but i i had an idea that i wanted to make like a glitch art zine Um, that's kind of had, like, some more long-form writing in it. Um, and I, yeah, I was wanted to do that with one of the video synthesizers, like, get some images created that way. Yeah. Well, were you thinking, like, to VHS, or what were you thinking? Um, yeah, no, I was thinking, like, a real zine, and, like, uh, like, yeah, like a print zine, but also, um, yeah, using, like, VHS tapes to, to synthesize, or, like, yeah, as the source material to synthesize the images or maybe um digital too i don't know okay so yeah using the synthesizers yeah source material for the for a print zine yeah exactly it'd be very cool uh and where you think kind of as where you thinking like words like long format like poetry short stories i think yeah kind of maybe like um maybe like prose sort of um stories yeah i don't know something kind of maybe like a way to like process some of the like gender feelings that i've been having and like just kind of general like spiritual growth lately because i had this astrology reading yesterday about uh because i really want to know about my saturn return because that starts on february 18th this year and Uh, My astrologer said that, like, the couple months before and the couple months after are going to be, like, really rough. And I've definitely been experiencing that already. I feel like I'm going through a lot of, like, transformation right now. And then also Chiron transiting through Aries, I learned, is, like, fucking my shit up. And I was like, you know, I think I uh, have a lot of thoughts and feelings that maybe I could benefit from writing down. Can you explain the Chiron traveling through Aries? So, uh, parent, I don't know exactly who or what Chiron is, um, but my Chiron is in Aries, apparently. Or no, mine's in Leo, right? But I have a lot of Aries placements, and your Chiron, I don't know exactly, like, what it sort of represents. Um, I know that, uh, when it transits through Aries... It, it can mean that there's like wait actually i took notes on this so i could actually sound smarter than what i'm rambling um what does chiron and aries exactly mean chiron represents like wounds kind of trauma i think insufficiency like self criticalness are all things that come up when it's like you know transiting through like an area where you have a lot of placements um 
my astrologer was saying that like existing hurts and i was like so how long is chiron going to be transiting through aries because that sounds really rough and they were like uh only till like 2028 and i was like <laughs> uh, and it's 2022 yeah, I was like, now i know i was like um that's not great i don't I, I don't know yeah so i was disturbed to hear that um but yeah i don't know i think that yeah basically chiron seems to represent some like pretty dark stuff like wounds and trauma um i'm i don't know i think that yeah that plus my my saturn return is just like causing me to go through a lot of like transformation lately and i think it could be good to try to channel that into like some sort of piece of art even if it's something i don't necessarily share with people yeah i think when so what age is your saturn return usually it's usually from like age 27 28 to 29 30. okay that's what I thought. Yeah, for me, it was um, definitely a rough transition, but I, around 30 is when you start, when kind of stuff starts, at least for me, falling into line more and you start realizing like, oh, this is what being an adult is and not yeah. in the like the stressful way of your early 20s, uh, but more in a manageable way of like realizing kind of who you are, but also just like, realizing that there isn't much of a difference between being an adult and being a kid. Um, but being an adult, you give less of a fuck. Uh, yeah. and it, it just, that mentality of giving less of a fuck and like letting things go and not being like bogged down by certain things that would normally stress you out. Um, definitely helps a bunch, uh, but I mean, it's all, it's all relative too. I know I've been dealing with like, um, a lot of mental health stuff and just kind of feeling like I, I'm at a crossroads, uh, both just creatively and um, career wise, because it's like I'm getting yeah. more hours at work, which has been super, you know, helpful um, financially to kind of to to keep me afloat and everything. But then also realizing it's like it's not even with the amount of hours I'm getting now, it's not a career, even though there's aspects of my job. I like, it's not something it's like, yeah, if you get enough hours, you can be lucky enough to live paycheck to paycheck with the wages that they pay, uh, in retail, but it's like, you're on your right. feet all day. There is no saving for retirement. There really isn't like, if you want to take a vacation, if you want to take any time off, you know, you have to, you're sacrificing that pay. And so like trying to feel it, realize what I want to do and then trying to figure out if an MFA is, is something one that I need and one that I want. Cause it's like, I don't want to go into more debt just to at the hopes of making connections. Like in one aspect, I do think an MFA or just grad school in general, but specifically an MFA would help me like refine the type of work that I'm making because there's a lot of people who know a lot of things that I don't know, because as far as video art goes, I'm completely, you know, just self-taught, just figuring shit out, turning knobs on these circuit menders. And then as far as the premiere stuff goes, if I run into a wall looking up tutorials on YouTube and yeah. um, so I'm wondering, yeah, if grad school were, but I was kind of like kicking myself because I thought the, application deadline for SAIC for grad school was April 15th because that's the date I kept getting on Google but that apparently is the undergrad date and the grad oh, date no, yeah. yeah the grad date was January 10th which is we're recording on the 9th so tomorrow and I was going to try to rush and get all my stuff in to apply for the fall but I was like there's no way I want my you know if I'm going to apply I don't want to just apply and not get in like that's a, that's a waste of $90 if I want to apply, I want to be 100% sure that this is the right path for me and 100% sure that I'm going to get in because I don't want to waste my time. Right. And then also just needing like the application process of like, oh, I've got to like request my transcripts. I've got to get like two letters of recommendation, which I can get. But it's like part of the thing for me, too, is like 
being out of school for as long as I've been, I can get letters of recommendation from artists who, who I've worked with who know my work really well. But if I get a letter of recommendation from a professor, unless they're checking up on my Instagram, like I doubt they're watching the show, you know, like they don't right. know. I graduated in 2014. It's now 2022. So it's and my work from undergrad does not reflect the work I'm creating today at all. So I guess just a letter of like knowing me as a person, at least back then. Right. Like a testament to your abilities as a student. Yeah. I don't know. SAIC would be really cool. Even just getting the, the membership to go check out the museum whenever I wanted. Definitely. Uh, Yeah. So if definitely not fall, um, but if, if, the stars align maybe spring 2023 um and then looking up and figuring out the deadline but then it's also like in the meantime just figuring out a career because i even part of my hesitation to grad school going back and forth on it is thinking about getting stuck where i currently am because it's very easy to be like oh well i'm going to grad school my current retail job is like a good job that I can just like take less hours and still keep there. But I guess my biggest fear is like going to grad school, keeping the job I'm currently at getting through grad school, getting a ton more debt and then just still being at the job I'm at just with an MFA now. Right. (laughs) Totally. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I feel like my skill set is there to make something. And I feel like the potential, not just talking about my work, but the potential for like glitch art and new media art and whatever this thing is that we're doing is so much bigger than the small kind of categories and holes that it's been put into. Cause it's like mm-hmm. the glitch artists that I like and respect. If they're not making the actual tech and running a store and selling it that way, what they're doing is NFTs, which is just not a space for me because right. in the sense that like, I, I will defend NFTs to a point, but at the end of the day, NFTs is just a new form of ownership. And the point is to get rid of ownership. Right. Um, and then the other thing is like live visuals at shows and music videos, which I love. I mean, I think is really cool. But I just think that glitch art has more potential. Like, is there, and how do we, how do we reach that potential? How do we get, like, build an audience outside of YouTube and Twitch? Like, I want to, you know, I want to see my shit. I, when we went to that horror drive-in, yeah, uh, that was like a lot of like VHS tapes. Uh, I think it was Strange Tape Zine was the opening movie. It's like that. I want just like, I want art house, but at, at the drive-in, you know? Yeah, totally. Yeah. I think that would be really sick. I would love to see that. I'd love to facilitate that. We should make it happen. Honestly, yeah. I feel like combined, maybe we have the, the resources and connections. Yeah. And maybe, maybe someone is watching this and is like, I have a movie theater. Let's make a, <laughs> an art house, you know, film festival right. for yeah. outsider artists. Cause I feel like we are both would be considered outsider artists at this point. Yeah. I think that would be really cool. What was your kind of relationship with filmmaking? before the variety hour in terms of like, I know you had some stuff that you submitted to like film festivals, like shorts and everything. What was kind of that experience like for you? Yeah, I, well, I started making films in college before I even became like a film major. I just was around a lot of film majors. And so it just seemed like really accessible to me. And I came up with an idea um, uh, and it was about like gender dysphoria and I was able to shoot it and then submitted it to some film festivals and it got in at the LA Transgender Film Festival and 
I think a couple other places too, maybe one in Champaign. And um, then I was kind of like, oh, this is actually like pretty easy. This is like, not easy, but it's like, it's, this is a, a way more accessible art form than I ever imagined it would be. And it's rewarding and I, I feel like I have vision. And so then I started majoring in it and made some like various different types of short films just cause you know, I was an undergrad. So for each class, you're kind of doing something different. And I really liked documentary um, and I really liked experimental. All my experimental and documentary classes were my favorites. And I like, I just felt the most inspired by the stuff that I learned about there. And then after college, I didn't really make a ton of films anymore. I was sort of, yeah, just not really doing that. And then I like worked in the film industry for like a couple shoots with The Onion. Um, and I was on like the camera crew or like the like sort of like tech crew for that. And just realized that I really didn't like working in the film industry and that I could not like I don't know I wouldn't be able to do the like hustle culture and also just like um I don't know it felt like a very inaccessible space to me as like a non-binary person at the time and like I don't know this world that had once seemed so accessible to me was suddenly really inaccessible and so then I started, I was like, well, I guess I kind of just have to do my own thing. Like I have to just get like a desk job and then do this on the side. And then the variety hour was just an idea that I had had for like a really long time where I just like really envisioned myself as a talk show host of some sort. Um, and I just like the world building that is available to you with like a talk show just really appealed to me. Um, as someone who's really inspired by Pee Wee Herman and Eric Andre, I was like, I feel like there's a way to do both of this. And then, yeah, then the Variety Hour is really the only kind of film stuff that I've done since then, at least of my own. I've like been in some films and like helped out with other people's films here and there. But yeah, for the most part, it just seems like, I don't know, especially as a, a trans person, it just seems like doing it yourself and with your friends and your community is just more, I don't know, more accessible to me. Mm -hmm. And I really would love to do like a, a short, um, like a narrative short someday or like an experimental short um, with like kind of a higher budget. I don't really have, I have like a couple ideas floating around, but I don't know. There, I just have so many different, inspirations that I I would really love to narrow something down and like actually make something over the course of a couple of years um I know I was just saying how I need to do something that's like more short form where that I can like pick up every day but like I would love to be ideally I would love to be working on small projects like that like a zine while also like having something bigger in the works that I you know, like writing a film and then getting it made within a couple of years. Um, but so I really hope to do that someday. I think that 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 is achievable now that I'm like, especially meeting other trans filmmakers and like, I don't know, just other weirdos who are doing weird shit who aren't necessarily like funded by anybody and are just, yeah, I'm mean, like, there are ways to get things done, you know? Yeah. And feels really good that 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 is like on the horizon for me eventually yeah absolutely
I'm excited to, to see it, and I'm excited to um, collaborate in the future, too. Um, Definitely. I got this book, excuse me, by Sid Field, uh, The Foundations of Screenwriting. Mm. I've been uh, I've been reading that and just like highlighting the shit out of it and I can definitely like loan you it. I but it's it's been super helpful just like thinking in terms of like very basic things in storytelling, specifically screenwriting storytelling that are taken for granted. Like yeah. a story is three parts, a beginning, middle, and end. Mm-hmm. A story is made up of characters and then the change that happens to these characters is the plot just like very simple things broken down into a formula that you can apply to any any screenwriting and um i don't know i think it's it'll be very helpful if especially if i ever want to get back into comics or with the show um i kind of want to take it in a new direction this year where I think in certain ways, the, I think the formula is funny, but in other ways it's like, I don't want just hours and hours of boring content where it's like, what am I drinking tonight is a funny bit, but the solo episodes is, is not what gets people watching. And I've even talked to, uh, coworkers who was like, yeah, the, you know, the solo episodes are, are interesting, but like what I really, when I actually tune into the show, it's because of the artists and in interviews. That's because of when yeah. you're actually talking to someone. So doing more of that, doing more collaboration and doing more just kind of experimental filmmaking with the show as the vehicle. Yeah, definitely. I like that idea. Yeah. So for this one, for instance, it's titled Midwest Landscape Painting, and it's either going to end up being just an interview with you or just like a couple interviews um, together, kind of spiced up with this footage and see, I don't know, see how that goes. And as opposed to doing it as a podcast or a talk show, Mm -hmm. Um, what if every episode is a film? Yeah, totally. Totally. I think that's a really cool challenge. Yeah. And whether or not I can keep up the weekly basis, we'll see. But as opposed to, I think this last year and the last couple of years, like when I started the show in 2020, it was all about quantity. And now I feel like I'm at a point where it's about refinement and it's about quality. Yeah. Interesting. And it's not at a point where it's not, I've used that as an excuse in the past to kind of sit on my hands of just like, oh, it's not how I want it to be. So I'm just not going to do it where Mm -hmm. I feel like the quality still does come out of the quantity a little bit. Like the more and more just you produce, you will eventually like find those gems. I don't know. I was rewatching the our diners episode and I kind of wish we could have recorded this at a diner but obviously with the spike and and omicron we don't want to risk that and also don't want to put those uh those workers through that because it's like working i'm a lot safer working retail but even even there i'm just like what are you people doing (laughs) yeah (laughs) why are you here (laughs) go home um but just rewatching the diners episode and it's just like wow this uh this is my favorite film. <laughs> like <laughs> it, it's kind of, you know, the, just this conversation, it, but with the footage too, it's, it's partially documentary. It's partially still very much like an art show. So yeah. much kind of, but so, yeah, I don't know. Thinking, trying to think of different ways to expand on that. Totally. I think that's a really cool idea. I also would be very interested in that screenwriting book. I feel like, also, I don't know, have we ever talked before about how comics are movies? No, but I love that idea. Yeah, expand on that. I think that, yeah, like the um, the conventions of both screenwriting and cinematography are like very, very present and prevalent in comics a lot of the time. Um, obviously, depending on kind of how experimental a comic is, but... 
Um, with like most comics and graphic novels, it really feels like a movie. Like, you know, Daniel Klaus is like my favorite comic artist, I think. Mm-hmm. And his his stuff is very cinematic, you know? I think that's why like Ghost World was such a good movie. Um, it It's very... And and um, or like Charles Burns, um, Black Hole is like extremely cinematic. Like the the conventions are all there. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting to think of, even with mainstream comics, how. I don't know. I was thinking about it the other day with the like shitty Marvel movies, how we've kind of gone through this loop of you had comic books like you had like superman for instance that was eventually turned into radio dramas and then these radio dramas with the with the kind of introduction to film but specifically when you had like speaking film as opposed to silent film uh, you would have these series of films like you'd have so many zorro films and you'd go people would go like every week to go see you know, the latest Zorro, the latest, you know, whatever the big movie was. And then this eventually turned into television, these serialized. And now it's like the, these comic books are turning back into, um, like I do agree with Scorsese that the, the MC movie, MCU movies are not cinema. They are a roller coaster, but I would go farther and say it's not cinema. It's like television and not even, the kind of we are in the golden age of television. This that isn't that, or we were maybe we're out of it now. Um, but it's it's television, but on a on a big screen, like all these movies kind of like interact with each other. Yeah, definitely. It's they're serials, you know. They're yeah. like, I think that's very true. Also, th- comics. Yeah, I feel like comics and film are so hand in hand because the the screenplay book also talks about the kind of difference between writing a novel and writing a screenplay and who is the author of the great gatsby um is that was it f scott fitzgerald let me just google it because i think it's the author of the great gatsby there was a author who kind of really just wanted to write screen yeah i think it's f scott fitzgerald but i could have the wrong author in general but but the um sid field mentions an author who tried his whole life to write a good screenplay and came from novels and just like could not write it well and the reason sid gives for this is because an author of a novel is doing so much with the words to try to describe everything that's going on, but a screenplay yeah. is more kind of in tune with comics or in tune with like painting, uh, kind of like sequential painting of like, you are not telling you're showing. So yeah. it's, it's you're showing these images and yes, there is dialogue and stuff, but the actual kind of interpretation of the story, the way people, it depends completely on how they view it is mm-hmm. how they're going to, take away from it it's it's you consume the media differently than you would a uh, novel definitely yeah yeah and like um right when i think about like storyboarding you know that's straight up just comics really is yeah and like that's your i don't know and it's just it like certain i feel like sir i I'm kind of like rusty on my like cinematography knowledge, but I know that certain like cinematography conventions are often utilized also in comics, you know, like having characters facing each other when they're talking um, and like have you want to have like you wouldn't want to cut to like an angle that doesn't really make sense with like the flow of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, And I mean, yeah, just stuff like that. What do you think the, uh, do you have any ideas for 
kind of the plot of your your future zine? Or is there a plot or is it more I'm I don't know. I have um I think that it I it would I can't really picture me doing something that is like uh, completely like one topic the whole way through mm. kind of like the variety hour I imagine there would be like a lot of different things happening like different segments basically um, and I would probably call each issue an episode because that's just like I don't know that's just like where my mind goes I guess Yeah. Um, because of the variety hour but and So I think that I would have different segments. I would kind of want it to be kind of like, you know, when you were a kid and you would get like a kid's magazine, like highlights or like there was like 17 magazine, like how, you know, I I don't know. Every new segment was just so exciting to me Mm -hmm. and I loved all the different variety of everything. And um, I don't know, I could see myself doing something like that where it's kind of just like maybe even following some of the conventions of like a magazine like having like a like interview and then having a like embarrassing stories or like an advice column or something um a crossword i don't know but then yeah. also like doing weird esoteric shit like uh visual poetry and um i don't know talking about being like a freaky transsexual yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> um, when you were talking, there was a question I was going to ask. And now I'm having trouble remembering what it was. <laughs> oh, yeah, I guess with the with the theme of the episode, um, Midwest landscape painting. I don't like landscapes. I, I, it's funny. I like looking at landscapes when they're real. Like I mm-hmm. like, you know, beautiful landscapes, uh, especially if you're going on a road trip, just seeing the skyline and everything. But when it comes to paintings, one, I just don't like realism in general. And then two, I don't know, just landscape paintings are kind of boring. But I guess the theme for this episode, I wanted to see if I were to make a landscape painting with video, what would that look like? Which is what Mm, this episode is. So it's painting with the colors of the, the CRT through the circuit bender or the wave pool or whatever I'm running this video through. Cause I taped it. I taped a ton of footage and dubbed it on VHS so that I could glitch it. But I guess I'm wondering what, how has being from the Midwest influenced your own artistic practice? Yeah. Um, yeah. I identify really strongly with the Midwest because I've lived in Illinois my whole life and having lived both in the suburbs of Chicago and then Southern Illinois and then Chicago, all of which are very different. I feel like I've explored a good portion of what, of what Illinois is like. Um, and I have felt really connected to each of those places throughout my life. And I feel like, um, I don't know. Yeah, that's an interesting question. How is the Midwest? I think that part of something that's really special about the Midwest to me is that you kind of have to look for your people and you have to find... um, You have to find your communities you have to really actively seek them out a lot of the time Mm -hmm. um sometimes we have to work a little bit harder as weirdos to find our people in a place like the midwest um you know it's different than being a weirdo in new york city um 
and you know in times where I've lived in more rural areas I feel like some of like the isolation that I felt in terms of being trans um, and being weird and being an artist uh, some of that isolation that I felt really um, I don't know caused me to create things that I wouldn't have you know and informed my art practices in different ways and yeah finding that community and finding your people feels more meaningful when you've had to work harder at it Mm -hmm. um and i don't know yeah there's there's also a sort of like and i think like because of that i think that the people in the midwest have um like a very specific kind of attitude about you know community is is really like thick i think when you find it here Um, yeah or at least that's been my experience and i don't know something i think also that's cool about chicago is that we have a lot of weirdos here and we have a lot of people making cool freaky shit um but there isn't necessarily the like added ego of LA or like the hustle culture of New York you know Mm -hmm. Um, people are are able to kind of like slow down here a little more and that's something cool about the Midwest Um, and I think that it leaves more room for experimentation absolutely Um, I would say It's interesting, too, just how big the Midwest is. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because I could title this episode Illinois Landscape Painting since it's all from Illinois and we're both from Illinois. But it's it's interesting just the how different the rest of Illinois is. Like Chicago is so different from the rest of Illinois, but I could never see myself living anywhere else. Right. And central is so different from southern. It's, I don't know, it's it's a strange place to be, but an interesting place to be. Definitely, yeah. I love Illinois. I always sort of like, I think before I went away to college, I kind of looked at my parents who had only ever lived in Illinois and kind of, you know, was like, okay, well, I'm not going to be like that. I can, I'm going to explore i'm gonna live lots of other places and i definitely am not like ruling that out as a possibility but i think at this point in my life i've realized like no yeah i mean it's illinois has so much to offer um i don't know maybe that's such a like a corny thing to say but i feel like there's just a lot here especially being in the city you know um i'm like yeah no this is this is a really good place to settle down yeah I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's corny, but I could make a a corny joke about the amount of corn we have here. (laughs) Um, I guess we're coming up on almost 40 minutes. Is there anything else you want to kind of say the audience before we sign off? Um, You know, wash your hands, look both ways before you cross the street. All good advice. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Mitch Mitchell, so much for being on the show. Anything you want to plug before you go? Um, I mean, check out my Twitter at ZarMitch. Uh, I'll be hopefully making some art this year. I would love to make some art and show it to you guys. So I hope Absolutely. That we can connect. Yeah. And we'll have you uh back on the show when the uh when the art is available. Yeah, hell yeah, thank you.
Oh, <laughs> 